So we are live now. We can start. Today okay. you will have to conduct. Huh? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so hi everyone. After uh, the last few sessions on degen uh, scoliosis and degen spine, today we have an interesting session on uh, high grade listhesis. Uh, we'll start with the classification, the SDSG classification, and uh, how it uh, helps in planning of the surgery. The next comes is uh, Abhisar will help us in uh, knowing what are the reduction maneuvers and uh, techniques. Then we'll have a small discussion and a paper review on uh, how does conservative management help in uh, high grade lysis and uh, how reduction maneuvers can change pelvic you know, parameters. Okay, we have an so interesting to uh, Priyank sir to start with the SDSG classification. Yeah, I'm just sharing my screen. <clears throat> so just before we go ahead with the uh, SDSG classification, that is a spinal deformity study group classification, uh, a little bit on the history. Uh, so first, Meerding and all had classified lytic lysis depending upon the degree of slippage into grade 1, 2, 3, 4 and spondyloptis, which was eventually uh, modified by Newman and Dewald. But the other type of classification that were used were by Wilson, Marchetti and Bartolozzi, which uh, who essentially classified these based on the etiology. Uh, Mac Thiong et al. realized that global sagittal balance also played some parameters and hence he included the pelvic parameters, which was eventually modified by various groups and uh, it uh, came out as the SDSG classification. So uh, the key points of this classification system is that it includes both the grade of slippage and the pelvic, par pelvic parameters. Uh, it also helps us plan surgically, especially for the high grade listesis. So uh, the first step in classifying is to know if it is in the low grade or the high grade category. Uh, grade one, two, three, four, and five are based upon how much percentage it is uh, slipping anteriorly. And uh, the, uh, the type 1 and 2 fall in the low grade category and the type 3, 4, 5 fall in the high grade cate category. So as soon as you see an x-ray, first you localize yourself at the L5-S1 junction and calculate if it is a low grade type or a high grade type. The next step is uh, zoom out and see the entire global sagittal balance. So for this, you are going to require a whole spine standing scanogram top type of a lateral view. And here you drop a line from the C7. Uh, and if it is crossing behind or touching the femoral head, then it's called as a balanced spine. And if it falls anteriorly, then it's called as an unbalanced spine. So at, by these two steps, you will essentially have calculated if it is a low grade type or a high grade type. And will have known if it is a balanced or unbalanced spine. So the next that you do is zoom in and calculate the pelvic parameter. The pelvic parameter, which is of uh, you know importance to us, is going to be the pelvic incidence. So you calculate the pelvic incidence. If you're not uh, the other way to calculate it is you sum the uh, the pelvic tilt and the sacral slope, and you get the value for the pelvic incidence. Now, based on the pelvic incidence, you'll come to know if your pelvic is antiverted or retroverted, or basically if your pelvis is balanced or unbalanced. So based on all these information, uh, you have six types by, defined by the SDSG classification. Uh, so first is you see the grade and then you see uh, the pelvis and based on the pelvic incidence, which plays a bigger role in the first three types, you have type one, which is a, you have type one, which, are, which is a low pelvic incidence pelvis. Uh, you have type two, which has a normal pelvic incidence and type three, which has a high pelvic incidence. So mind you, all these are low grade, which means they are less than 50 degrees uh, listesis, uh, less than 50% slip. Uh, and these are classified based on the pelvis. So you have the retroverted pelvis, you have the normal pelvis, no, you have the antiverted pelvis, the normal pelvis and the retroverted pelvis. So that's type one, two, three. I'm going to show you pictures eventually. And type four, five, six is based upon the global balance. So in type four, you have a balanced pelvis and you have a balanced spine. Whereas in type five, you've got an unbalanced pelvis and balanced spine. And in type six, you have both. 
so again uh, don't get jittered by this uh, just go step by step and you'll reach at this conclusion so uh, first you see type 1 type 1 is it's a low grade uh, listesis with a uh, with a unbalanced pelvis which means the pelvis here is antiverted then type 2 is where the pelvis is normal and type 3 is where the pelvis is uh, retroverted in all three if you notice that the global sagittal balance is maintained then you have all the high grade uh, listesis where the list, uh, where the slip is more than 50% so the first type is where you have a balanced spine uh, and you have got a, a retroverted pelvis <coughs> the type 5 is a high grade listesis and the flat of the pelvis it's called anti retro is a khada anti pelvis. yeah 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 ulta uh, this is the yeah so, so this is the type 1 ha huh? correct if you start from so that, type 1 again yeah this is a retroverted pelvis correct where the pelvis is more vertical so the vertical. base of your entire eiffel tower is very narrow correct that's why low pi is not considered a good thing in general correct correct sorry so the ahead. sacrum looks yeah so sacrum looks vertical over here and then it becomes more and more horizontal in type 5 uh, there is a high grade listesis and you have a vertical sacrum so the the only thing is here because of the compensatory because here there are no compensatory mechanisms in place and your uh, the spine overall becomes uh, balanced so that's uh, one type of uh, that, that's that's one uh, condition and the other one is a similar situation but the entire spine is unbalanced so based on the uh, based on all these factors they have classified listesis into the six type now a general recommendation uh, sir do, do we start discussing now uh, because that's the end of the classification system yeah 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 so we can so uh, the general recommendation is in a type 1 type 2 and type 3 pelvis you try all conservative uh, treatment and almost all of them are going to work and if they don't work then you have to fuse and uh, you get whatever reduction you can get in this patients the main talk about reducing a, spa, a listesis starts when you are dealing with a high grade listesis so here you have to deal with this three types of listesis now this first type which is a type 4 year uh, here you have a balanced spine and you have got a, a good pelvis right so here what you need to do is here, these are cases where you can have a in situ fusion uh if there is not a lot of instability these are patients where you can consider doing a delta type fixation so here you don't need to really stress on the amount of reduction but this is the type where although the pelvis is balanced but the uh, although the spine is balanced however the pelvis is not balanced and this type of patients you should attempt reduction uh here again there are two subtypes based on the kyphosis at the lumbosacral junction where few articles they recommend is that if there is more kyphosis more than 80 degrees then you try to go up to the pelvis so these are patients where you uh, should attempt reduction and these are patient where you should definitely reduce because if you do not reduce these uh, patients then you're going to have a overall a bad outcome and uh, how to reduce such type of patients is what dr abhinin is going to tell us sir so that's all from my side so basically this classification as uh, it progresses it uh, becomes worse and worse right yes it's a treatment related classification where the earlier types you can fix in situ the latter types 5 and 6 you need to consider reduction Correct. and um, the whole thing was that um, you know we did um, uh, level 1 i mean grade 1 grade 2 grade 3 grade 4 grade 5 that was so easy to understand but the, it was not a treatment oriented classification so even the grade 5 you could fix in situ and get away and sometimes a grade 2 you know you fix in situ and then it collapses afterwards so uh, then came to light that the what we are treating at spondylolisthesis could be linked to the entire spinal balance and that's where this classification came in because it needed to tell you uh, you know the a relative perspective of how the listesis stands in relation to the spinal balance because then it becomes a treatment oriented classification so obviously it is come in after the pelvic parameters came through and uh, which is why it's important for us to know uh, this class today everyone will ask you this if you get a, get a case of high grade listesis anything else anyone wants to discuss yeah. so here goes that um 
so a, a case of a high grade spondy is not is definitely not everyone's favorite case so when you get a high grade spondy in the clinic you uh, you have too many questions that come to your head and you're not sure about which way uh, you know this is going to go and all you know is you know how to classify it you know what um, maybe looking at this can anyone say what type of uh, is this a light ache is it a anyone dorsif It is lytic cystosis, sir. Uh, why lytic? <coughs> Is there? Sir, a dysplastic cystosis. Why uh, dysplastic? Sir, the age of the patient is twelve years old. Now uh, the because this is a very high grade grade four cystosis. The sacrum is uh, not. It's more dome shaped. Maybe on an X-ray we can find it better. And the the L5 is also more trapezoid and not a square uh, L5. Correct. So uh, I think all three points you got right. The fourth point would be in relation to the new classification that this looks like a messy pelvis. It's a vertical sacrum, and that's a hallmark of dysplasia compared to uh, lytic, where uh, you know the problem happens at the par. So the pelvis normally is not a messy uh, pelvis. So I think all these four uh, those would be. pointer so anyway th these are the questions that come to mind you don't know how to treat it and you don't know what the plan is and um, you know it's there's an easy option of just putting in plate screws decompressing and getting away and uh, as you can see in this case it's a five year post op you can, you can see solid fusion on the sides so uh, you know why would you want to then uh, mess around with reduction etc and that's where this classification comes in but uh, before the classification i think all of us young turks would like to reduce it because if you just fuse in situ what will all your friends say if you reduce it you come out looking like a tarzan surgeon and everyone like looks upon you and everything it's like a very macho very ortho thing to do reduction but the fact of the matter is that the whole world has been doing uh, in situ fusions uh, i mean no one less than my boss this is his favorite uh, surgery it's a uh, screw or a double graft that goes from the uh, you know base of the s1 right into the Uh, 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 body of the L5. It's called a delta fixation, and it's a very very convenient approach. And uh, Dr. Bhujraj has like years and years of uh, results on this. And uh, the fact of the matter is that if they were not doing well, he would not be doing it. So the you know the bottom line is that people with this in situ fusion also do very well. And uh, what is the and here's one step ahead. This is boss ka boss, Dr. K. V. Chobal's case, which is uh, in in side two. non instrumented fusion done for a high grade spondy mind you this is a lytic it's not a dysplastic so you can see the pelvis is not so bad but you can see the end result is a long long term follow up complete fusion it's uh, startling to see these kind of cases and this seems like such a simplistic approach compared to uh, what we are about to describe that why would you want to take the risk and take the headache and do the reduction and how is it the i mean the key question i'm raising here is how is it that this works if so much is said about uh, reduction and so much is said about pelvic balance how is it that there are cases and cases you know that uh, have 10 and 20 years of follow up which have been fixed in situ and have not slipped further or there's been no adjacent segment there's been no spinal imbalance and that's where this classification that was described comes into play and you will find that a very very small corner of the table uh, where there's an imbalanced spine imbalanced pelvis and a high grade lysthesis that combination which is a very small percentage you will see um, you know in uh, I, i'm uh, quoting from literature it's less than 20% of cases less than 1 in 5 cases fall into that category where you have a high grade spondy an imbalanced spine and an imbalanced pelvis so there are sometimes imbalanced pelvises with a high grade spondy but the spine is balanced and there also you can get away this is that you know in situ but can try reduction where you have a imbalanced pelvis but a balanced spine so a very small major a small minority of cases you really need to reduce so the question is then why reduce right so do we know this as a fact we as a unit or you know many surgeons go out there uh, when they see a high grade spondy their plan of treatment is reduction and fusion so why is that so again orthopedic logic right so think about what goes into a, a high grade spondy think about the elements of spondy so on the left it's instability we know that there's no bone on bone so it's an unstable column it's a no brainer uh, next is there's a neural arch stretch so uh, there's a continuous because it's a tension band that's uh, you know getting pulled all the time and uh, again there's nothing holding it back 
and then of course there's foraminal compromise and uh, what these guys really need is of course a neural decompression they need a realignment and a fusion right and when you do a reduction um you get a much better bone on bone surface to fuse and that's again orthopedic logic if you have a femur that's kept apart and you put bone graft the chance of it healing are much less compared to when you align the femur i mean it's a so when there's a bone on bone uh, the contact surface is much more uh, the pseudo arthrosis rates go down uh, as compared to when the end plates are not uh, aligned with each other of course uh, once you are uh, you know once you reduce your weight bearing axis becomes a compressive axis and hence the rate of progression of deformity goes down because the vertical is now trying to help your fusion rather than to distract it uh, compared to when you leave it hanging out uh, better decompression because you have aligned the elements the elements have come in place you remember that compression in a listhesis is because of a misalignment so if you align you get an automatic reduction and you really don't have to go crazy about reducing the or uh, decompressing the nerve roots etc which you will have to if you have kept it uh, in situ right and uh, of course correction of the sagittal balance so orthopedic logic suggests that you got to go and try and reduce and you got to up your game and learn how to do this reduction maneuver rather than um, uh, you know rather than uh, accept an in situ fusion so this is a controversial statement and uh, you saw cases and cases where you don't have to reduce but i'm still going to sell my the bag of goods and say that you want to reduce a spondy as much as you can so uh, here the uh, you know the golden words as they say are attempt to reduce reduce as much as you can safely um, get a good fusion and correct the lumbosacral kyphosis like even if you don't get a good reduction but you correct the alignment of the l5 over the s1 so the l5 is sometimes kyphotic over the s1 if you can get that alignment right then how much you pull back is not that critical and uh, you know the fine line between doing too much and injuring the nerve root bet between doing just adequate and getting as much as you can so you got to play that middle game but i personally not i'm not a fan of you know throwing your hat in the ring right at the beginning and saying i was throwing the towel in the ring and saying i'm sorry i'm not going to reduce i'm going to just fix this inside too right so uh, reduction technique seems quite easy if you see this diagrammatic you take away the posterior elements you pass uh, you uh, open up the disc space Uh, knock off the dome of the sacrum you know open up the spinal canal put in screws and reduce right it seems quite easy but there are some uh, you know nice technical tips that i'd like to discuss and uh, right from positioning so um, once again we belong to a category who like to you know start like this and not like that but this is the described position and uh, sajan hegde appa ji all these guys they like to do this so under anesthesia if you extend the hip which means that you put a bolster under the thighs uh quite different from what we normally do there's a some kind of a anti version of the pelvis that happens so you can see the uh, you know image on the right here you see the angle the kyphosis between the uh, sacrum and the pel uh, and the s1 is significantly reduced if you can raise the hips up because the hips have a limited uh, extension capacity beyond that they will take the pelvis with them so maybe 20 30 degrees the hip will extend after that when you extend the hips or take the femur uh, above to the ceiling the pelvis actually moves so a lot of uh, these surgeons who are proponents of this position say that under anesthesia when all the muscles are relaxed the hammies are relaxed the quads are relaxed just positioning gives you half the work because remember most of your work is correcting the kyphosis and not really getting the reduction and as you can see in this image and i've i've been party to some cases where i've been an assistant to hegde or uh, appa ji and i have found this useful i just find it a bit cumbersome and i'm a bit impatient but Uh, we have not really suffered uh, by not doing this too often though we nowadays try to do it a little more so uh, the verdict is that you should try to give that position now remember that these are the structures that need to you need to release so just like in any other deformity uh, a high grade spondy is a deformity it's not a degenerative case remember so like in any deformity the first principle of correct correction of deformity is good releases if you do good releases the force on your implants and hence the force on the neural structures is significantly lower so take everything that you can like throw the kitchen sink in so of course anesthesia positioning muscle detachments a good wide exposure facetectomy discectomy sacral dome osteotomy and then ilio transverse ligament so uh, if you can release all this you're going to have a really free lying uh, body of l5 and that may be your winning game um, just one word on this ilio transverse ligament because many of us can never find this remember that the transverse process of the l5 was so deep in a high grade spondy that you really can't even reach them and invariably it's a dysplastic so those processes are so small 
right? So, uh, we feel that a heavy weather is made out of really releasing these iliotransverse ligaments. But in some cases, very few cases, especially the ones that are chronic, uh, you will find, a, you know, this kind, you see the CT scan on the right corner, some ossification where the iliotransverse ligament is actually ossified. And this is a no-go. You will have to release this. But there's a disclaimer here that most of these are not mobile on your dynamic x-rays. So why do we get away? Because we do dynamic x-rays and you normally find mobility. So if you find a high-grade spondy with zero mobility on dynamic x-rays, get a CT scan, see if there's something else that's holding it back because then you'll have to plan your release accordingly because it's not really easy to reach here. Remember, you'll have to probably take a Mercedes-Benz incision and reach there or really dig in deep and you know there are some uh, funny structures over there. So you got to know this beforehand and the clue is a high-grade spondy of a chronic nature with uh, no mobility on uh, x-rays. Any questions so far? Please stop me when uh, at any point. Now there are some video clips of uh, simple exposure. Mm. Remember just like the tea of a restaurant tells you how good the chef is, not the high-end dish. The exposure tells you how good the surgeon is. So make your exposure really, really cadaveric which means every bony landmark should be seen visually. So the exposure should be bloodless and cadaveric. Spend the most time of your surgery in exposure. Not only does it give you great landmarks, great landmarks help you to put your implants well, uh, easily and quickly uh, without too much, uh, you know, that's your navigation. It helps you with less blood loss. It helps you with a great release. And of course, it helps you with fusion. If blotches of soft tissue are there, fusion gets affected. So um, a good exposure as a senior. And you see the surgeons going lateral to the facet joint here. And uh, that's the key because you go down on the side of the facet joint and uh, you actually expose, as is seen in this picture, you expose the pars. And uh, uh, mind you, you have to expose the inferior border of the L4. You can't do an L5-S1 exposure. You, you may not be instrumenting L4, but you want to still expose L4 because um, the L5 is way down deep. And uh, you, you know to find it, you need to find the L4. So just uh, up front, don't try to play shadow games. Up front, uh, expose the L4. And uh, once you've done that, you will see in this bottom left image, the, the, the capsule of your L5-S1 junction is quite rife. And you've got to peel it off with a, you know, with a cautery. You have to expose that facet joint and the facet joint should start looking at you like this, as you see this in this image. And then you drive your osteotome down and, uh, you know, take down the facet. So this is a very key step. Uh, this image is a bit forgiving, but very often the inferior articular process of the L5 totally covers the superior articular process of the S1 and becomes a major block in removing the, uh, you know, removing the lamina of the L5. Um, and hence, knocking that off is your first step because that's your first part of release. You totally detach the lamina of the L5 from the S1. Typically, it's a rattler. If it's a rattler, then you've got to try and remove it N block for a variety of reasons. The, the least of it being that it's a you know great surgical technique, but the most important is that you once you remove it end block, you have very little trash tissue. This yellow mark here is the trash tissue that is there at the pseudoarthrosis. And if you uh, remove this piecemeal, this becomes uh, difficult to get rid of in the end. Well, if you remove it in toto, the entire bone is out in your hand. And once the bone is out in your hand, you can easily punch your way across and uh, release the nerve roots um, well. So here you see the detachment happens from the top. Uh, at the level of the lysis and uh, uh, at the bottom where the yellow ligament uh, is, uh, you know, sitting on the undersurface of the lamina. If it's a dysplastic, uh, the pars is invariably, uh, you know, poorly formed. So again, it's worth your time to actually cut the pars and create a lysis and take the rattler, uh, make it a rattler and take the whole element off. Uh, north of that, so the cut that you make, you know, in a, in a, uh, sorry, in a dysplastic, you make a cut there. So north of that cut is um, your uh, pedicle anyway. So it's always worth making that cut over here, you know, using anything for a forward punch in osteotome, uh, 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 ultrasound. So if you make that cut there, you know that your pedicle is going to be somewhere here. And uh, hence the recommendation is that you create a rattler if there's none present. And uh, uh, the next step in your mind as a surgeon is to now look, go hunting for the L5 root because uh, unlike most spine cases, the, here the exiting route is the one that's in big trouble and not the traversing route. Sometimes you don't even have to see the traversing route. And to look for the exiting route can be a real challenge. You can see this MRI image. See where that exiting route is gone. It's like centimeters anterior to where you're working. And you really have to go after it. And the problem is that uh, the stuff that's sitting on top of that route, you know, the stuff that you see here, is pseudoarthrosis and pseudoarthrosis is stuff you've not often seen. 
it is sticky fibrous tissue that doesn't give you a good feeling because you don't know are you pulling out nerve tissue sometimes you feel that because it's not like friendly uh, you know friendly familiar uh, uh, kind of item it is something quite new and it's stuck to the nerve so uh, this part where the surgeon is taking away everything that's lying on top of the l5 root so this is the s1 root that's been well exposed uh, this is the possibly the pedicle of l5 and uh, the surgeon is taking out everything that's soft underneath that to expose the l uh, to expose the l5 root there's some bleeding that happens there the key element here is that uh, in high grade dysplastics the pedicle is already small it's deep and in your enthusiasm to take away this soft tissue on top of the l5 root you can end up snipping the pedicle and then lose your um, you lose your handle on the pedicle it has happened uh, even to me so you have to be you have to run that fine line between taking away too much so the key is here not to take off bone just take off the soft tissue do it with soft hands if you have to press hard means you're catching a bone if you can take it out with soft hand you've left the pedicle the, the whatever little pedicle is there intact and um, you know this is really what you got to decompress and uh, this bone that has been defined by these two blue lines is really the key because this uh, you can see the line on the left is not encroaching on the pedicle the pedicle which is narrow sclerotic is still being left untouched but you're still taking away the roof that is sitting on top of the l5 root i hope i'm not uh, over emphasizing this because you can't over emphasize this and uh, here you can see a very good exposure of the l5 root and you can see how far off you've taken the l5 root so it is again key, uh, key to do this that you expose the l5 root as distally as you can because after this you're going to be manhandling that l5 root once it's under vision because when you do the pull push you're going to manhandle it today of course we have emg and we of course emg doesn't help you it has to be sorry uh, uh, mep doesn't help you it has to be triggered emg uh, of the l5 root that's the only thing that works so if you're asking for neuro monitoring which you should in these cases you ask for uh, triggered uh, you know triggered emg probes where while doing the maneuver you keep triggering or actually touching that l5 root and um, uh, by touching the l5 root you will see whether you will know that you are not uh, uh, you know harming that root because there is almost a 20% incidence of l5 root palsy uh, despite doing this kind of exposure so that the key to avoiding an l5 palsy after your reduction is the three things one is to expose the l5 root very well if you don't see it it's injured that's what you got to assume the second is that do a really slow reduction maneuver and don't overkill it don't try to keep pulling after the giveaway has happened and uh, the third of course is uh, intra op monitoring if you can have triggered emg your chance of getting an l5 palsy is low having said that most l5 palsies that i've seen have recovered so it's normally transient but it gives you a crappy feeling so uh, you know it's rather rather that you avoid it the next thing to do is now look for the disc space and it's easier said than done um the disc space as you can see in these images here no is really not forthcoming normally when you reach uh, when you do such a wide exposure the disc is just sitting on your face here the disc space is hidden and uh, you got to really look for it also you're working invariably in the axis of the l5 root here the disc space is not available at the shoulder of the s1 root the s1 root is totally out of harm's way it's the l5 root sitting on top of the disc space so you got to burn over there you know you'll find bleeders and you know you got to all the time protect that l5 root and still get around sometimes it feels impossible sometimes you feel i don't think i'm going to get to this this space without harming that l5 root it literally sits on that uh, space in the lytic list this is and it's stretched out so even to retract that from underneath near the ganglion gives you the jitters but you got to do it and rarely you can have a case like this where the uh, this space is very very forthcoming it's like a good morning this space mostly it is something like this or even like this where uh, the disc space is pre collapsed and to enter or to even find the entry to the disc space becomes difficult uh, my favorite instrument which i'll recommend all of you to use is a long handle osteodome a 5 mm osteodome which has a good long handle so you got a very good control you have a good grip on it and it's not a fiddly instrument and it's thin and yet it's blunt at the tips because you've overused it so it doesn't drive its way and i'll tell you why because if it's a sharp instrument you uh, try to align this in in you know in vi uh, vision of the l5 i mean of the s1 because you've seen the s1 and you invariably end up driving into the l5 body and that's the worst thing you can do cuz uh, that takes away the end plate so you got to actually probe around for the angle of the disc and that angle is very very different than what you imagine and this is the one that tells you exactly where the you know where the osteodome nicely walks in so you don't actually hammer it you just use it as a probe find out the angle at which the disc spaces 
and once you get that osteotome and it's thin enough to go into that disc space you start rotating it like a pukka and uh, it starts to open up the disc space so uh, remember me when you use it the next time it's an instrument that you will fall back on for every case because it's uh, it's the narrowest pukka that you'll find uh, rarely you get to cut the disc space like this almost never in a high grade spondy it's invariably shoving in an instrument like that and tilting it with your wrist so the disc space starts to toggle and open up and you will be surprised suddenly how much confidence you get because you've now seen the disc alignment which which line the disc is in and the disc space automatically starts to open up uh, the next thing is to take out as much disc as possible because uh, uh, believe it or not disc is really where the release happens and uh, without by sparing the annulus on all sides if you can take out as much material from inside you end up slowly increasing in a non existent disc space just as you keep working inside the disc space using everything that you have on hand uh, you will uh, see that the disc space opens up remember not to use scoops to take away the end plate because in disc plastic especially the bones are quite flimsy and the minute you drive your scoop like an ice cream scoop you'll just take away a block of the end plate and that gives a very bad uh, surface for the cage to settle and the cage starts to settle and you get pseudo arthrosis you sometimes can get an inflammatory or infective discitis also so uh, this is the temptation of uh, getting into the disc space and uh, i mean getting into the disc space with a sharp curet take away as much material as you can and there are multiple types of uh, you know curets that are available like angled curets etc now comes the dome osteotomy once again uh, a lot lot is said about dome osteotomy have- but it's an intuitive thing that when you look at the x ray if you find that there's a this whole lop like you saw in the other case sitting there it's obviously going to come in the way of your reduction and you want to trim it down but if there's no lop so there are two situations shown here where there's a good likelihood of your uh, of the, the top of the sacrum coming in the way of pulling the l5 back so again you decide this basis of the x ray so you'll see different different alignments here different for different situations have shown up and some of them you may need the dome osteotomy some of them you may not so don't go with a pre fixed plan if your disc for a uh, disc uh, pukka is going in very easily and flat you probably don't need the dome osteotomy but if it's getting blocked or if the x ray shows something like uh, sometimes like not even this but i would say uh, maybe here you want to take away the corner of the s1 and maybe here you want to flatten the s1 so it's some it's a judgment that you make and it's not a big deal it's not like some dome osteotomy you have to just chisel off the end plate and that makes uh, it's almost like expanding your disc space uh, disc space that's all stuck you you know cut and expand it so it's not a huge deal and um, after this is the s1 screw now you have a choice of passing your s1 screw before all this action happens but typically it's a good idea to pass it uh, pass screws after all this has happened and uh, remember the s1 screws are very critical actually there are just four screws here and all four are very critical so the s1 screw has to be tricortical which means it has to get into that corner this green arrow shows here and it's not so easy both these red arrows are incorrect placement because the s1 screw is on which the l5 is going to get pulled back now remember the s1 is a, a sacrum is a cancellous bone so the sacral pedicle screw is actually a crappy screw because there's no true pedicle in the sacrum so it's not like any other pedicle screw so you have to get a tricortical purchase going across and there's a very specific technique of passing the s1 screw on another time we can talk about it it has to be long convergent it has to cross the other cortex and it has to meet at that corner that uh, that screw can't go can't go here it has to go there now once the s1 screw is passed um, so you can actually do it under uh, in fact i would recommend that you do it under fluoroscopy so you know you don't miss that uh, uh, that corner of the sacrum where both the cortices meet uh, once that is done um, the most difficult part for me that's the s1 uh, l5 screw and why is it difficult so the l5 screw is universally the most difficult lumbar screw to pass in a dysplastic or a high grade spondy you just look at this x ray and you just find the pedicle wanting all pedicles are seen but the l5 pedicle is not seen for various reasons it's sclerotic narrow and it's aligned in a very different manner the tube is not looking at you it's looking down so you're completely lost on it and hence uh, i implore you to pass your l5 screws only in an open manner don't try and pass it before in a uh, fluoro guided manner open uh, technique is much much better and um, when you pass the l5 screw once you have it under vision no you will also see that the direction of the screw is way off from the direction of the l5 of the s1 screw so uh, it suddenly dawns upon you that it's best that you do it uh, it's not an intuitive direction like mostly you know where the direction of the pedicle is once one screw is in but this is a completely off so it's a good idea for you to expose the pedicle from underneath 
and uh, once you can palpate the under surface of the pedicle because you've taken away the pseudo arthrosis uh, uh, an open screw becomes far easier you know exactly the direction again here don't hesitate if you need to use a fluoro please go ahead and use a fluoro so you get your direction right make sure that it's a long and a very very medialized screw the screw should be long and it should go very medial because the more medial it is the longer the screw the better the purchase it should be like converging because the l5 screws what's ultimately going to pull back the l5 and if that is loose your attempt to pull back will just cheese the screw out and your you know you fall flop on your face so a good long screw l5 and now you're in business you're uh, ready to okay now after you pass the screw you see what the surgeon is doing on this in this video here sometimes the head of the screw sits so much on that nerve root because it's all gone deep there's a very flimsy flake of bone and then there's a nerve root that you get tempted to pull the screw back but remember this is a slight of eye and the minute you get a good reduction that root will look quite easy so invariably once you pass the screw you start wondering is the head actually crushing down on the root you are sometimes tempted to pull it back but it's a good idea to explore that so after passing the l5 is the reduction maneuver which by now has done itself in so if you've done all these steps step wise no the reduction maneuver is there's nothing to be done actually because you've released everything so now the question is pulling back and distracting so how do you know how to plan that the uh, uh, one simple way is uh, what mostly what we do is passing a reduction screw which is a long threaded screw so uh, the you know the, this screw is the s1 screw sitting way posterior or way superior and uh, this one goes way deep inside you give your lord a good, uh, rod a good lordosis so you see when you put the ini in here there's so much uh, you know movement that's going to happen and this as as you start tightening the, the ini the you know thing starts to pull back try to do it both simultaneously so rotational scoliosis does not happen and it's a uh, it's a gradual pull back the stuff that would have prevented this full pull back would have been the disc and the discal tissues and the soft tissues and the facets which you released so uh, while doing this you will get the maximum amount that is comfortable and uh, while doing this of course keep checking your l5 uh, nerve root and make sure that that is fine again if the screw was not well put it would cheese off so uh, you got to get that kind of reduction having said that there are some lesser ways of doing it or some easier ways of doing it the easiest being that you uh, engage the l4 so when you have a three point so when we used to use steffi plates we had to do this because the steffi plates didn't have the option of a reduction screw so you had to put an l4 screw so you have the l4 and the s1 screw sitting at one horizontal level the l5 screw way deep down so when you tighten this it pulls it back it's a three point reduction which is far easier and far less um, you know cumbersome on the uh, screw bone interface so my choice is this one on the left but this is an option uh, there are some other options where they actually tilt the pelvis so this comes into the uh, sdfg 65 classification where the pelvis is imbalanced and you want to make an attempt to actually anti vert the pelvis there you put in long pelvic screws and there's a the ao has devised this long handle uh, you know that sits on the pelvis and you do that and you actually reduce the pelvis just like you did in the positioning you reduce the pelvis to the l5 and then fix it in situ uh, and then of course you can use distraction as a maneuver to reduce which most of us don't because the l5 screw l5 nerve root is already struggling and uh, then the question is do you put the cage first or do you reduce first common sense will tell you that cage will come in the way of reduction so you want to reduce and then pass the cage except in a situation where reduction is not happening the cage will give you some distraction and that distraction is that amount to reduction but personally i feel that if you want to uh, distract you can use out triggers and distract and then put the cage i don't like to put the cage and reduce on top of the cage but i can tell you this that there's a bunch of surgeons who obligatorily put the cage and then do the reduction maneuver i don't know what's right but what works for me is what i'm telling you you can use um, uh, two other options one is an out trigger to distract you can use an intra discal like a pukka to distract or you can use uh, this is something that we often tend to forget these long handle uh, you know screw heads or uh, 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 screw drivers that sit on the screw heads can be used to actually correct the kyphosis and distract so it uh, it does two things of correcting the kyphosis as well as distracting and you can get into the disc space and after that it's your standard t lift you measure your cage size um, i i always feel strongly about putting a cage because that ensures much better structural support aside of fusion and then you bang your cage in and then uh, uh, that's the end of the surgery so uh, basic tips if you had to take take home a message was a thorough release in the disc space in the bones watch the l5 nerve root all throughout the l5 screw under vision long and convergent 
and non forcible reduction maneuver that's the you know, that's what's going to help you you know uh, doing this reduction in a in a nice way okay that was a long lecture if you have any questions sir when uh, do you go to l4 any specific criteria almost never according to me it's a rescue uh, it's a rescue uh, act but um, this guy la martina has given his concept there's an article i'll try to put in in this called la martina square so, where if you draw a quadrangle and if the l4 is sitting outside that quadrangle it's it's little complex i'll send put this article on the chat then you go to l4 but that's about the pelvic balance business so uh, the only discuss so why would you go to l4 one is to get a pelvic balance and the other is to aid your reduction to aid reduction i don't think you need to go to l4 unless it's a you flopped and you know you as a fall back but for um, getting the alignment of the pelvis sometimes you need to go to l4 because it can help you get a much better lordosis the amount of lordosis that you can generate with an l5 s1 fixation is less compared to an l4 to s1 fixation sir so uh, in that uh, sglt classification the type 5 one where there is a good global balance but the pelvis is not favorable uh, means you've got a, a retroverted pelvis uh, there they have described a further two subtypes where uh, you have a lumbosacral kyphosis which is very high or low if there's a very high lumbosacral kyphosis there are certain articles which say that you should include 4 over there which is the same concept which you just said but uh, uh, with with some objectivity to it uh, so it's in that classification system right i agree so that classification actually alludes to this that when you want to reduce and when you don't want to reduce but uh, in general like i said no only 10 20% of cases fall in that you must reduce category okay so if no other questions we can quickly move on Yes, sir. So, else, so anyone has any uh, inputs? Like anyone wants to suggest something that they do? Or... Oh, sir, uh, can you can you tell us about the implant systems of choice? Because a lot of these high grade are kids. So, what kind of screws would you advise? A regular system, a pediatric system, the sizes of screws. So, uh, see for S one, no, um, a mono actually is a good idea because the S one is that solid block. You got two rods sitting on the S one, which should not dabble around. So S1 mono, if you have the guts, is a good idea, and the S1 can be a big screw because the S1 pedicle universally is very very big. So it's a six uh, mm screw, and invariably you oversize it, uh, let it go across and converge it adequately. The L5 can be contentious. I've never needed to put anything shorter, smaller than five mm, but sometimes you have to swallow your pride and put a five mm, remembering that uh, these pedicles are very narrow, and uh, you know you, they can burst when you put a six mm. so it's something that you got to gauge and um, there's enough literature suggesting that 5 mm screws are as strong as 6 mm screws it's just our orthopedic uh, blood that makes us want to put thicker screws so it's a good question priyanka i would uh, i mean that's something i missed uh, in this talk that you may have to settle or you want to settle for smaller longer screws than uh, fatter shorter screws in l5 and then reduction screws makes your life easy the problem with reduction screws is they are polyaxial and a polyaxial screw does not guarantee you reduction in a single plane because it goes all over and that's why if you can use both nuts you know tighten both nuts slowly you you get the best chance of not rotating it off if you had mono axial reduction screws that would be like the top of the game but we don't have them and i think they'll uh, you know raise the stakes a lot make make yeah. the surgery far more difficult right so we'll go on uh, is there you are muted yeah uh, now we have uh, thoughts dr dosi who will uh, review our article which uh, shows how effective is conservative management uh, for high grade spondylolisthesis so we first understood uh, why to reduce based on that sf sf sgf d classification and then we understood how to reduce now the questions two questions that need to be answered are do we need to operate at all and if surgery then reduction or not what does the literature say on these so tosiv is going to talk about should we operate at all and he's got a good article on uh, non surgical management of high grade spondees again it, the title itself sounds counterintuitive but you should hear what he says go ahead tosiv yeah Good evening. Uh, 
I am presenting an article on surgical versus non-surgical treatment for high-grade spondylolisthesis in children and adolescent, a systematic review and meta-analysis. It was published. It was uh, carried out by Hu and co-worker, and it was published in the Journal of Medicine uh, in March 2016. So, objective of uh, this study is to evaluate surgical and non-surgical intervention for high-grade spondylolisthesis using the change uh, uh, using the change of health-related quality of life as a primary outcome measure. in systematic review the secondary objective of the study is to determine whether there is a difference in clinical outcome based on slippage progression so it was a systematic literature search which was carried out from january 1965 to november uh, 2014 using medline embase and cochrane library the analysis and eligibility criteria were documented according to prisma guidelines and according to cochrane back review group editorial board noa scale was used to assess the quality the inclusion criteria for this study include high grade spondylolisthesis or spondyloptosis age 18 years or younger minimum 18 months of follow up type of treatment which was included uh, are surgical and non surgical intervention and study design which includes randomized control trial and observational studies editorial comments case report conferences were excluded from the studies patient with dysplastic uh, spinal deformity such as neurofibromatosis severe developmental delay who would be unable to complete the outcome questionnaire were excluded from these studies so in total 1596 studies were included by the search and after reviewing titles and abstract 86 articles remained for screening based on inclusion criteria 34 full text article were selected for assessment 29 studies were excluded and only five studies are included for meta analysis so these are the studies which are included in this meta analysis which include three retrospective cohort studies one prospective database and one observational case study the result includes there is no significant difference uh, which is found between surgical and non surgical group in srs 22 domain of function there is no significant difference between surgical and non surgical group uh, in other two sr uh, sr 22 sub score which include pain and satisfaction domain pool mean difference in progression of sleep between surgical and non surgical group was uh, there was no significant difference so to conclude there is no significant difference between surgery and non operative group uh, uh, in the quality of uh, life assessment and progression of sleep uh, sleeps with low quality evidence and non operative patient had no radiological progression of their sleep during follow up periods though it is well designed and strong evidence study there are limitation to this study the limitation includes the publication availability that is number of study included are very less that is only five studies are in, included in this study there is bias which is inherent inherent to retrospective and non randomized studies complications uh, which is uh, uh, which are there in surgical and non surgical group are not included in this studies and there is publication bias which uh, can be judged by the fact that only few studies uh, have qualified uh, the uh, and mentioned about the absence of significant difference of sleep between conservative and surgical groups thank you so dosi bhai you convinced that uh, high grade spondees need not be operated based on this uh, review sir there is a uh, very low quality uh, 
uh, evidence which suggests that uh, there is a significant difference between uh, the uh, operative and non-operative group. So I am not convinced uh, basically with this study uh, to not operate the high grade spondy. What do you think would be the you know the weak link in this study? Because we are so convinced that if you get an adolescent high grade spondy, it's going to progress, especially a dysplastic one. I, I, yes, sir. Uh, the flaws, as I have mentioned, that only five studies are uh, studied in the study, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the case of publication bias. That is, which uh, only few studies they have compared for the uh, di difference in the presence of sleep. So. Uh, which overall used only a very low quality evidence uh, for the non-operative group. And it must be a mixed bag because um, often the degenerative high grade, which is, includes a lytic, will auto-stabilize. We've seen that all the time in practice. But a um, dysplastic high grade, almost 100 out of 100 will and progress if it's high grade at the time of presentation. So it's like comparing two yes, com entirely different etiologies. And of course, there, there's no mention of the balance. If it's an imbalanced spine, then even a low grade will progress. So it's like just randomly picking up uh, grade two plus listices and putting them in one bag, and uh, which is why it's not published in any of the orthopedic journals and it's published in Journal of Medicine. So while it makes interesting yeah. reading, this article is more uh, reasonable to read to criticize it. Just like the vertebroplasty articles that came up in the New England Journal of Medicine, which said that vertebroplasty and sham is the same. There was a huge bias in the selection also, right? So if you select cases that are you know, that have a natural history of settling and compare them to cases that have a, and you have, you know, 25 cases that are bone on bone, you know, degenerated uh, high grade versus, uh, you know, five cases of a spondyloptosis or a grade four dysplastic. Obviously, the, you know, you'll find that 25 didn't progress, five progress, so there's no evidence. And that gives out a wrong message. And it's up to the reviewers. And remember, the journal reviewers are physicians in a medical journal, typically or they are low-end surgeons. And any uh, good uh, reviewer will see this fall through. And if the reviewer doesn't see it through, the editor does not really know the, you know, they, that's not a strong point. So when you read a journal, everything from what journal it's published in to the type of authorship and everything comes into play because ultimately we all want to publish something. So if we, if I can get it through in any journal, I want to publish it. So the authors will do their best to push it through. And the filters depend on the level of the journal that's it published in. So if the filters are not good, it makes its way through these kind of articles. Anyone has any thoughts on the this publication? Anyway, it was interesting reading. And then the yeah. last, yeah. Yeah, and which, so all high grade distances have to be operated. So it's like that. Dysplastics at least definitely. We've conserved so many of the degenerative variety. When I mean degenerative, I must say I'm talking of lighting because uh, degen listesis per se never goes beyond grade two, even grade two is rare. But lighting, they often, so the difference being that if the elements are in good alignment and the disc tends to collapse, you get a bone on bone and they actually fuse. And we've got so many cases which we've conserved and over the years they fuse, auto fused. Uh, if they don't have radiculopathy in that status, they can just live their life. Some who develop radiculopathy, uh, even in that condition, will need a reduction and or at least a decompression. But uh, the dysplastics, you know, the elements are against them to stay put. The elements are such that it will just keep on slipping and these invariably are growing kids and growth becomes a big enemy. And uh, just like a scoli in a 10-year-old kid, which is 40 or 50 degrees, has to progress. How can you say it's not going to progress? But if you compare that to a you know, a degen adult scoli in a 70-year-old, which may not even progress, or a neglected scoli in a 50-year-old, it may not progress. So you can't just grade them all uh, into one category. Uh, so, sir, now I'll uh, discuss on uh, an article which describes, does reduction actually have any effect on the pelvic parameter? Uh, it was uh, recently published in 2020. Uh, in the Asian Spine Journal. So this uh, actually is a very contemporary uh, discussion because uh, 
uh, we are not talking of should we reduce or not but when you are reducing with the view that you are going to get the pelvic parameters right uh, this article will tell us whether you are actually achieving your goal uh, so it is an article which was published in the asian spine journal uh, and it was a article from the cmc velor uh, it's a retrospective study published in 2020 uh, so yeah they included all high grade listesis which were defined as a sleep which was more than 50% uh, and it is well known that the as we discussed that there is a prominent role of surgery in high grade listesis indications of surgery are generally progression of sleep neurological deficit uh, back pain and radiculopathy and spinal deformity now the this, uh, debate is always about should we reduce or fuse in c2 uh the advantages of reduction as we discussed are that uh, they reduce the chance of pseudo arthrosis because they give a bigger surface area helps in early fusion uh it is also believed to have a effect on spino pelvic parameters and the sagittal balance the aim of this study was to analyze uh, sagittal spino pelvic pelvic alignment uh, that is influenced after an alpha s1 reduction of a high grade listesis so it is was a retrospective study uh, they included 41 patients from 2001 2002 to 2015 uh, out of them because of uh, suboptimal radiograph thing uh, 35 patients were selected indications of surgeries were uh, as discussed slip progression neurological deficit spinal deformity back and leg radicular pain uh, the approach used was either posterior or an anterior plus a posterior uh, approach uh, to reduce an an interbody fusion was done so a standard uh, lateral and ap x rays from l1 to uh, s1 with pelvis and both femoral heads were taken the pelvic parameters were compared pre op and post op which includes slip grade pelvic incidence sacro slope pelvic tilt lumbo sacral angle and the lumbar lordosis they were classified uh, they classified the patient into two groups the balanced pelvis group and the unbalanced pelvis the balanced pelvis were those having a high sacral slope and the uh, less pelvic tilt than the others were the low sacral slope patients so the cohort included 16 patients with grade 3 uh, listesis 15 with grade 4 and 4 with grade 5 listesis the average slip was 74 degrees which was more than grade 3 the average pelvic incidence was uh, 61 degrees and the mean follow up was 39 months that was more than 3 years uh this is the uh, results that they obtained in the entire group now the sleep angle was significantly corrected uh, where the p value was less than one because it all of them were reduced uh because of reduction the lumbar sacral angle was also corrected and even the lumbar lordosis were corrected which was significant but uh, when we see the sacral slope and the pelvic tilt where we defined the main pelvic parameter uh, there was no significant difference between the two when the entire group of the population were compared now uh, on dividing the patients there were 17 patients with balanced uh, pelvis and 18 with unbalanced pelvis uh, here also as we see the uh, lumbosacral angle and the lumbar lordosis are all significantly different uh, however the only difference was that the sacral slope and the pelvic tilt did change in the unbalanced pelvis but the change was not significant so they said that the there was some improvement in the version of the pelvis however that was not significant and uh, what we discussed previously as well uh, during uh, apaisa's talk that there is no correlation between the change in the slip grade so reduction how much to reduce was not uh, significant to change pelvic parameter but reduction per se was important so five patient developed a complication of l5 root uh, which is a well known complication Uh, two of them had, uh, you know, and most of them recovered. Two of them had uh, implant failures uh, with immediate loss of reduction, and one of them had a uh, L5 screw breakage, but eventually it fused. So various studies have been done which favor both reduction as well as in situ fusion. Uh, so the reduction, those studies which favor reduction are a few of these. In all of these studies, we see some things in common is that all these had a significant difference in the sleep angle because all of them did a reduction also since they reduced the lumbar sacral angle change in all of those and the lumbar lordosis change uh, since all of them were reduced uh, however here in these studies as well the pelvic tilt and the sacral slope did not change significantly when in situ fusions uh, studies uh, were taken into consideration the same results were found that sleep angle did not change because all of those were fused uh, in situ 
but the lumbosacral angle in the lumbar lordos is also did not change were not significant which was same in both the groups so why do in situ fusion because the only good thing is that the, there are less chances of complications of l5 palsy and maybe it's a uh, less messy procedure however the disadvantages are that there are high chance of pseudo arthrosis there are very high chance of progression of the slip because of the abnormal sagittal profile and the neurological compromise can happen over the uh, long as a late sequelae because the nerve root is always stretched and then why to reduce now we reduce because it's been uh, documented that the spinal pelvic parameters have a very significant effect on quality of life also the new goal that is set up for surgery is both reduction and fusion where reduction comes uh, as important as fusion and uh, it's been said that the major lumbar lordosis is from the l4 to s1 and if we don't try to reduce then there will be compensatory mechanism will which acts like hyper extension uh, of the pelvis the retroversion which will eventually lead to the forward falling of the body and global imbalance so they concluded that surgical reduction of high grade listhesis re restored lumbosacral alignment however there was nothing in no change in the pelvic parameters how uh, so the strength uh, so this was the conclusion where they said that the pelvic parameters did not change but the lumbosacral alignment changed which was more in relation to the surgery that was performed and uh, not because the pelvic and there was no change in the pelvic parameters the strength of the study is that it was a single institution study there was a the follow up period was 3 year which is pretty long and they showed some improvement in the pelvic parameters which include the lumbar lordosis uh, but however it was modest uh, the critical points here uh, limitation include that there is no clinical correlation in the two subgroups because they both of those had been followed for 3 years however they did not describe clinically which one was important the sacral slope and the pelvic tilt did not actually change and so there was no change in the pelvic parameters only the lumbosacral parameters change so the reducers win when in, when it comes uh, when the lumbosacral parameters are compared but technically it's a tie because pelvic parameters uh, are unchanged in both the subgroups so still when we consider the pelvic parameters at the reduction surgery then the non reduction surgery is affecting them then still uh, there's no single answer that we get even after the the paper no uh, thank you sir today what are your thoughts about this concept or anyone's thoughts anyone in the group who's on this sir uh, when we uh, take into consideration the global sagittal balance and uh, the global parameters as we discussed Uh, even the SDSG classification takes into account, and all classification include all other parameters other than the PA and the sacral slope. So reduction will help when lo in longer terms because it will prevent at least falling forward of the body. But uh, basically, when we reduce, so I feel reducing the L5 over the S1, we never have the concept of aligning S1 or the pelvis to the L5, right? So you can't expect the pelvis parameters to change. so uh, which is why if you all go through the hardware profile no there's one ao in instrumentation system where you actually put in those sacral rods and actually or pelvic rods and you actually tilt the pelvis and that's where you will actually get a though i have never seen this surgery and i don't know whether it genuinely works but you're actually reducing the uh, sacrum to the l5 the other thing is this positioning where you try and extend the hips so much which i don't think uh, uh, rohit's group follows so so dramatically may actually they have, have a they have uh, mentioned that they do prefer hyper extension positioning right. as an important just right. mentioned no, if you look at that in detail you know how much they've got how much pelvic movement yeah. they've got right. pre op i mean i'm just saying that if you go through that then you might actually have some changes in the pelvic parameters so the concept of reduction is not to change the pelvic parameters you know it's like i'm not tried it so why should it happen the concept is to balance the spine so uh, mm -hmm. if they are able to balance the spine and the pelvis the you don't expect the pelvic parameters to change so while this is a good study and it brings a, a good thought process in your head you know new thinking wheel starts it uh, is almost intuitive to believe that a reducing l5 will not going to create a change in your sacral slope correct yeah. sir uh, also one practical thing that you can take back after reading this article is that uh, uh the pelvic incidence per se or the pelvis you 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 usually looking at the global spinal balance rather than the focused how the pelvis is changing so
so uh, you know if you if suppose you want to judge intra op uh, you know sometimes you think that okay you uh, start making some calculations intra op and try to see if you have changed the pelvic incidence or you try to measure the sacral slope and all it is not going to affect your uh, eventual outcome so the idea is that uh, try to reduce as much as possible and don't try to intra op try to uh, see if you have achieved good reduction or if you have tried to change the pelvic parameter because uh, see what it says that if you achieve a good reduction and uh, the sacral slip angle improves you are eventually uh, getting a good uh, that's that's the end result like you are not changing the pelvic incidence and also there's no point in measuring all that intra op try to get as much reduction as possible and eventually you will get a good outcome because the global spinal balance uh, will get maintained it also makes us think that why why actually in the uh, sd sg classification are we so much focusing on the pelvic parameters we could just have a simpler classification where you are just thinking uh, as far as your global spinal balance if it is balanced then don't reduce if it is not balanced then you reduce it boils down to that isn't it yeah another thing that you can think about you know it just pro- is that uh, some of these kids come very crouched a uh, crouched kid has a retroverted pelvis as a as a response to the listhesis and there you will find that once you reduce it may not be on day one but you see the child after 3 months he will have reset his pelvis and in those kids the actually the pelvic parameters will change because the compensatory mechanisms have been uh, undone you know the reason why they were comp- decompensated goes away and they come back to their original at least physically you know we've never done that in the measurement physically you see that they are no longer crouched so you would bet on it and say that their pelvic you know pelvic alignment will have gone back to where it should have been that either so also when we are reducing a high grade listus is that common question which i remember me asking you also that how much reduction is enough you know how much you want to reduce and where do you want to stop especially yeah. where there is a thin line where uh, where you are feeling that okay if you go that one extra mile you are going to uh, either lose in the screw or you might end up having that deficit that that hunch that you get at right. that time if you want to really have some objective criteria it's worth looking at the change in the uh, lumbosacral kyphosis because just by a simple lateral shoot of your cm pre operatively uh, pre operatively after positioning and after your reduction if you can measure the lumbosacral kyphosis and if get, if it gets reduced by less than 80 degrees eventually you know that the end outcome is going to good uh, be good so that that one parameter you can measure and use at, at that as a comparator of course we have to see at articles as to where if someone has actually done that but that is probably one measure because in consistently all of the studies uh, the lumbosacral kyphosis has changed significantly again a good point and again that's a good reason to use cages compared to not using cages because it yeah. significantly gives you a better lordosis especially when you crunch right. down on the posterior elements great so great discussion on uh, on a very focused topic if there are no other questions or uh, there do you want to uh, announce so, about uh, and then wind up yeah. tomorrow we have this interesting talk on early onset scoliosis uh, before we close uh, we have everything from assessing it to management protocols casting growth rods and uh, complication so just a reminder for this tomorrow 9 pm right Yeah, tomorrow night. And you will send out the link to all concerned, right? Be It's best to send out the Zoom link because all the relevant people, if they are on Zoom, no, they can uh, take part in discussions from the uh, from YouTube. They can take part in discussions. Yes, yes. Sir. So we will send links to everybody. Perfect. Okay. So call it a day. So, yeah, and the nice discussion today. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks. Good night. Bye.